welcome to everyone to um, our our second or third in our fallback series. I don't remember. I think I've lost count already. Um, um, brought to you by HMCT, Hoffman Smoken Center for Typography. I'm Gloria Condro, the uh, executive director. With me is my you know, incredible and wonderful um, co-host and chair of the graphics department, graduate and undergraduate, um, Sean Adams. Hi, Sean. Um, so we are, um, we have a wonderful guest and I'm so happy, Paul, that you are on sabbatical because sometimes it's difficult <laughs> to get people to do this. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Sean and I'm gonna turn it over to Paul. Oh, Victoria has joined us. Hi, Victoria. She is the student. Uh, graduate, the graphic student who invited Paul to be part of this um, lecture series. So um, without further ado, because I have to leave, unfortunately, Paul, I might not be able to see you at the end. Usually I pop in and I ask you all these very difficult questions, <laughs> but I'm going to leave it up to Sean to introduce you and to carry on and to say to everyone, enjoy it. And I'll, I'll definitely see you at the next fallback series. So thank you, Sean. And Bye, thank Gloria. you, Paul. Thank you, Victoria. Bye. Thanks so much, Gloria. Paul, thank you so much for being with us. I mean, so um, you are, um, I mean, the work that you've done, you know, with the Queer Archive and, um, you know, the Library of the Printed Word are, is so remarkable. And the crossover between media, and, or sort of the, I don't want to call it media promiscuity, but it's sort mm -hmm. of, um, we could go there. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're just so agnostic about it. Like it's just sort of this incredibly fluid, um, use of, of all of print, analog, you know, digital, that I, I, I don't know, I'm thrilled. And um, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you talk about your work. And I know the students are going to have tons of questions. And um, Great. so we'll, when, when you're done, we'll come back and we ask you, we'll ask you the very difficult, personal, embarrassing questions. Well, oh, good. We'll, we'll start with Can't that way. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sean, for that for that introduction. And Victoria, thank you so much for the invitation and to Art Center for the invitation. I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen and get this going. All right. I'm going to assume you can all see this. Um, this is a, a live website. The whole talk is is here. Um, you can toggle between, you know, the slide presentation, a, a grid, you can download a PDF of the whole thing. Um, I, I really do like to, to present this way and to sort of uh, hand over control in a way to the audience, you know, to be able to come back and um, revisit the talk and look at all the resources. There are a ton of links in here. Um, anyway, so I'm just going to get started. The title the title of the talk today is Urgent Craft, and it's really kind of in two parts. Uh, the first half is a bit more like a, an, an artist's talk. I'm gonna introduce myself and, and my work and some of the things that, that Sean mentioned, um, and the idea of publishing as artistic practice. Um, and then we're gonna end up somewhere in here, uh, trying to get closer to this idea of urgent craft and how art and design can be used to loosen power. So I have worked as a self-taught graphic designer for many years with my own studio uh, in New York City for, for quite a while. And it was all client-based work that focused on branding and typography and traditional corporate identity. Um, I, Definitely enjoyed this work for the most part, and the business was really able to thrive for about 15 years. But after so much time accommodating the needs of clients, I kind of uh, reached a limit. Um, you could say uh, burnout is, is another word for it, and I felt like I needed more. So about 10 years ago, I started asking myself new kinds of questions, like what do I need from design when I'm not working for a client? Uh, what would it feel like to call myself an artist? And I was able to start exploring these questions through the form of the book, the printed book. And I started thinking about the printed book as a container, 
for ideas, which sounds kind of obvious now, especially talking in the context of a art and design school, but, but this was totally new for me. Um, this is a project that I did in collaboration with the John Cage Trust. And this one was for an arts festival during the London 2012 Olympics. It's a set of 12 books about the towns of Weymouth, England and Weymouth, Massachusetts. And these books are like little journeys through uh, perception, exploring history and the connections and disconnects between these two places. And I even created a typeface that I used throughout um, all the books based on a fragment of type that I found in a shed in Massachusetts. But this project was most significant for me because of the way I distributed the work. I made a small edition of each of the 12 volumes and I actually handed them out, went out into public uh, spaces, this is in Weymouth, England, and handed them out to people over the course of the 12 days of the Olympics, so one volume a day. And this was wild uh, because it was so performative and durational and it really tested my stamina. It was, the whole thing was a surprise really, but it was super rewarding because of how I got to meet every single person who received a book, you know, which is kind of unusual to have that kind of direct connection with your audience. And I did a whole series of projects like this, site-specific publishing, um, projects that were durational and event-like. And this is another one that I did in a small fishing village in Northern Iceland, where I spent the whole summer getting to know people in the town. The population of the town was 530, so, so that became the name of the project, as well as the number of pages in the book. And these were really intense relational projects because they involved spending time in these places and embedding myself in these communities. And at the end of this one, I printed uh, exactly 50 copies in Reykjavik and I left most of them back in the village with people who appear in the book, but I also hid a few copies all over Iceland. <laughs> And I did one more project like this in, in England on the Isle of Portland. Um, these projects were exhausting, honestly, and they were extremely difficult uh, because of the emotional depth that was required for them to be meaningful. And at the end of this one, I said, okay, that's it. I'm not, I'm not doing these anymore. And it was around this time that I started teaching at RISD. Um, I was also getting to know a number of artists who were working with the internet, but experimenting with it in print, seeing what happens when we slow down the internet uh, by printing it out. And this very quickly turned into another kind of project, a more curatorial one. I started collecting artists' books and ephemera made by artists who were printing the internet in different ways. And I called this Library of the Printed Web. And this became a way for me to ask questions about materiality, about speed in relation to reading, and how network culture was shifting. Especially because at that time, um, you know, the internet was really just becoming ubiquitous. Uh, it was everywhere with, you know, starting with the introduction of the iPhone around 2007, this was kind of like the five to seven years following that. And this also became a publishing project for me, a way to introduce new work by some of these artists. And this, this project, Library of the Printed Web, was, was really a lot of fun. Um, getting to publish this work and write about it and exhibit it, and the project received a lot of attention. And in the end, I, I produced about 20 publications through Library of the Printed Web. Uh, and started thinking about this as publishing as artistic practice, which is a term really that I'm getting from um, scholar Annette Gilbert, who published a book about this. And then in 2017, the entire library of the printed web project was acquired by MoMA Library, which was amazing. I mean, this was a, a satisfying moment 
the collection of about uh, 250 works at this point, including the ones that I had made, um, all going to MoMA, kind of the ultimate archive, you know, of artists' publications. So this is the moment in the talk where I really want to sort of pause and um, step back from my, my own work a little bit and ask some of uh, the larger questions here about these terms that, that I'm using. When, when I talk about publishing as artistic practice, what do we mean here? And I like to think about it in terms of making public, that, that publishing at its very essence is about putting something in public. And it's this image um, of a community bulletin board that I love to come back to as, as sort of the most basic example of making public. But is this publishing? You know, you might, you might be saying no. I would say that it is, that simply selecting something to amplify and posting that information in public um, to give it an audience. But then what about this? Um, is this publishing? It's certainly making public, but it's less about posting something and more about performing for a very specific public. So it brings up the idea of addressivity. Who are you speaking to? And perhaps not everyone in the public is included here, but just those who have gathered to listen. So that asks us to look closely at what we mean by public. Who is listening? Is this an act of publishing? This kind of, of making public really interests me deeply. And, and I'm going to come back to this jacket and to this image in a minute. As does this, um, these newer forms of making public that are very much about durational and ephemeral performance and communication. And I love stretching the idea of publishing into these slippery spaces. And here, which, which I think is a form that's super familiar to us now, platforms that have become places for us to publish on a daily basis, even. And then, of course, this, the ordinary you know, um, table at an art book fair, which allows artists to be on one side and the public to be on the other. Direct engagement in physical space over the published material. But these are not my ideas. I'm, I'm borrowing them from social theorist Michael Warner, who wrote about publics in this text. And, and there, is a, there is a link down there uh, when you get to the website if you want to read this. I come back to this text again and again, um, because honestly, it's really dense. <laughs> but when I teach it, I usually reread it with students to try to get a little bit further with it. And in this text, Warner is making distinctions between the public, meaning like everybody out there, um, versus a very specific public, say those particular people who have gathered intentionally around something. And so he gives us the, the notion of a plurality of publics, that multiple publics are possible. Warner says that um, to publish is not just to make public, but to make a public through the circulation of your material. A public gathers around the work and generates discourse and only then has a public formed. And you know, for students, and particularly when I'm talking to like thesis students or students who are about to graduate, this becomes really interesting. You know, like how, what kind of discourse do you want to be happening around your work? So previously, we may have thought about publishing as the production of objects, of things that you make, like books and zines. Warner kind of turned this around for me. Publishing is less about those objects that you make and more about the actions that you take, how those objects circulate. So your publics form around this action through the dispersion of material. So we can talk about publishing as an act 
um, or as the gesture of publishing, but what are they? What are the gestures of publishing? And I'm, we're gonna get to that in a minute. And the idea of publishing as performance, the performativity of publishing. Which is why I'm so intrigued by artistic publishing that, that is taking this form now. Things like live streaming as an act of publishing or the publishing of digital files that are meant to be downloaded, like this series called The Download that I curated at Rhizome for a few years, where artists created works that were um, entirely contained within zip files. The act of publishing is located right there in the uploading and the downloading of the files, the private performance of these files on the viewer's desktops and the circulation of these files on the internet. It's all about movement. And there's a whole world of net art that looks at publishing in this way, in the realm of digital files and networks. And for Rhizome's net art anthology, I was able to do some writing that's become really central for me uh, that ended up getting published in this beautiful uh, big green book. It's a huge catalog of net art where I wrote about the post as um, an essential act of publishing, as a, as a gesture of publishing. So posting. In the sense of, you know, posting a photo or making a blog post or posting a tweet, but also, um, I got into the history of this word, post, which, which I've never really been able to find too much about. I've, I've tried to trace the word back through time by looking at other words that contain the gesture of posting, like poster, the most basic uh, graphic design form or the most basic act of putting something up on a vertical surface in public space. And this goes back thousands of years, you know, uh, maybe tens of thousands of years, making marks on walls. So I think it's, it's kind of, a, for me, a foundational gesture of making public posting. But do you ever wonder about language like keep posted, or the post office, or the daily post, or even post-its? And this is, this is more speculation um, rather than scholarly research, but it seems as though the language that, um, that this language, the post can, can be traced back to the figure of the town crier who would announce the news at the center of town to people who maybe were not literate or who didn't have access to books. And when the town crier was finished reading the news, he would nail it to a doorpost at the center of town. And so the news was posted. And of course, you know, there's a whole history of artists. And I love, I love sort of tracing this line from this kind of speculation to a whole history of artists who have used this very basic gesture of posting in public um, in really powerful ways. Like this is one of the most obvious ones, uh, Jenny Holzer truisms in the 1970s. Um, more recently, Stephanie Sajuko's uh, project where she's using the, the form of, this, of the casual like tear-off flyer there to distribute URLs for downloading free PDFs. To Demian Dineyazi, uh, who letterpressed these words and put them up in a window across the street from a controversial um, statue or a figure of an indigenous person in St. Louis. And Zoe Leonard's publishing of the statement, I want a dyke for president, early in the 90s when the poet Eileen Miles was, was running for president. And then later again in um, 2016, shown here as a gigantic poster installed on the High Line in New York City. And Julia Wiest's uh, use of a, of a billboard to amplify a made up word. This is a really complicated project, but it's fascinating and it's really worth digging into. And, and once again, and I can repost this at the end, but, but the website version of this, all of these little captions at the bottom link out to these projects. 
So that's the post. Beyond the post, um, I'm going to propose just a couple of other gestures of publishing. Another one is stacking. Stacking is pretty basic also. Uh, it brings to mind one of the most common ways to distribute printed material in public space. You know, you just sort of use gravity. If it's not hanging up there or, or put up on a wall, it's probably sitting flat, stacked on a horizontal surface somewhere, like at a newsstand or at a bookstore or at an art book fair, or even just the idea of putting a table out in public, like this, this is a fairly new project called Library of Study in Brooklyn, where books that are curated around an abolitionist theme are put out in public on this table for discussion and for borrowing. It's a really beautiful project. Or stacking prints on the floor in a kind of sculptural way, like Edson Chagas at the Venice Biennale few years ago. And we can't really talk about stacking without also mentioning the artist Felix Gonzalez Torres, who really invented the stack as a sculptural art form in itself. Felix's stacks are unlimited. They're, they're meant to be constantly replenished. So this is a different take on monumentality. I would say he's dismantling the idea of the monument here, the sculptural monument. The sculpture here is less an object and more an act of publishing that's always disappearing and reforming itself. And if you're interested in reading more about this, this is, this is the only text I've been able to find on stacks by Susan Talman, the ethos of the edition, writing specifically about the stacks of Felix Gonzalez Torres. And again, the, the link to the PDF is down there. Dropping is another publishing gesture. Dropping is, is much less common, but we know about it from images like this one, um, which are really associated with propaganda and with the state. The idea of forcing an act of publishing onto a territory it's a really, uh, it's a colonialist tactic in that the author, whoever it is, if it's a government, is imposing on you from above, literally, and then disappears, dropping the message onto the land. But dropping is also this. It's the language we use today to talk about transferring digital files. We know dropping in a more sort of everyday way like this visualizing the act of publishing or sharing as passing files through the air, dropping them into someone's device or say dropping an album. In contrast, I really see this as dropping as well. We drop books off, we pick them up. This is this wonderful little free library project that is a network of these structures all over the world. This kind of dropping is, is less impersonal, almost intimate, maybe because of the physical location of these boxes in neighborhoods, in front of people's homes. Anastasia Kubrak has a really uh, interesting project that mixes all of these ideas where documents that are censored by the Russian government, she's, she's printing them and leaving them in these specially marked uh, drop points all over the city secret drop-off sites that are identified, you know, they're marked with this X in a box. And then there's Aaron Bartol's Dead Drops project, which are public USB drives that are located all over the world, embedded physically in, in walls in architecture. It's an entirely offline project for the distribution of digital material. The last publishing gesture that I'll talk about is streaming, um, or really feeds and streams. If you think about an individual tweet, for example, it's a single post, but these posts accumulate and they accumulate into feeds. The feed is a never ending flow of posts. And I think this is one of the most important ways for us to think about publishing today, the feeds 
that we surround ourselves with, that we're comforted by, that we nurture and take care of. If accumulating posts are a feed, then the nonstop feed is a stream. And so we have literal streamers, you know, who perform live on YouTube and Twitch and TikTok for hours or days at a time. And if, if we had more time, we could get into how this is different really from the old 20th century model of broadcasting. And even though it seems new, the feed has been around for quite a while. It's, it's a, really a product of the industrial revolution, but, but it's quickly evolving into something else now in late stage capitalism. I can't find any reference to the feed as a flow of information prior to around this time, the 1840s, with the sudden invention of, of the telegraph. And I think it's no accident, actually, that the photograph was also invented at this exact moment. It just took a while for these technologies to merge. Of course, this is what our feeds are turning into today. We no longer see them or recognize them as an accumulation of posts, but we experience them like an ambient presence. And if you think about the technology behind a device like this one, it's still about posting, you know, posting questions and receiving answers back that are posted back. Um, at least that's, you know, that's the mechanics of it behind the scenes. But the experience is much smoother than that. It's not an interface of buttons and boxes, but of natural language. And so for the, for the first time, I think those distinctions between what is or is not publishing are becoming very blurry, um, very ambiguous, maybe, maybe even erased. And as we engage with nonstop streaming in this totalizing way throughout all of our environments, we're seeing this collision now and collapse between publishing, digital networks, and surveillance. And this blurriness is not really going anywhere soon. It's becoming more and more ubiquitous and accepted. It's a desire that we seem to have, I think, right now as a society to protect ourselves with these networks of seeing and listening and the ideologies of profit and power that go along with them. It's crucial that we try to understand how all of this works, the politics of our platforms, how the same streaming always on platforms that enable us to publish and communicate and entertain and protect and isolate ourselves are also the very same platforms being used by capitalism to profit and to persist and by state institutions to surveil to minoritize and to criminalize. It's the ultimate smooth flow of interfaces that know us and envelop us now that I am most concerned about. Not because I don't enjoy them, but because I do, probably like most of us. As designers, we find ourselves in a very particular contradiction here. How do we participate in this? How do we continue to design these most perfect interfaces, knowing what we know? These are questions for each of you to grapple with as students, as working designers, as anyone invested in how design participates in our political state right now. My own battle with this takes the form of a demand. The demand to resist the smoothness of design perfection. So I make this de demand of myself, but also in my teaching. It means always questioning. Uh, more than that, it means always deeply examining the less, the, the less visible ideologies that are lurking behind the design products that govern how we live and communicate and also that, that we are designing. So for me, this means thinking about history 
um, looking at archives as, as time machines, really, and dialing back over the course of the last 50 years or so to see how others have resisted and persisted in the face of oppression. What can we learn from their ongoing struggles for liberation? And, and I'm particularly inspired by Barbara Smith, who was part of the Combahee River Collective in Boston in the 1970s. Uh, there's so much to learn about her. And she co-founded um, Kitchen Table Women of Color Press in the early 80s. Specifically, we can learn from her about publishing. And for that, there's this quote um, in this oral history, which I link to here. She's talking about a, a conversation she had with the poet Audre Lorde about why she started Kitchen Table. As feminist and lesbian of color writers, we knew that we had no options for getting published, except at the mercy or whim of others, whether in the context of alternative or commercial publishing, since both are white dominated. Radical publishing has been used throughout history as a form of survival, as a way to detach from mainstream structures of oppression, either in academia or commercial publishing, um, where whiteness, heteronormativity, capitalism, and settler colonialism have always been in full operation. They still are. Projects like Kitchen Table and Community Press show us how values like collective care and collaboration and sharing were fundamental to this kind of a publishing practice. Some other strategies used in the ongoing movement towards liberation have been interference and agitation, making good trouble, using visibility to interrupt the narrative. Which is why I love David Wojnarowicz's jacket so much. He wore it to an ACT UP demonstration at the height of the AIDS pandemic in 88. It's an act of design, it's art, it's a gesture of making public, but I would say it's an urgent artifact that contains the potential for radical action within it. It's less the work of a specific artist who publishes than it is the plea of a political subject struggling in illness. He, he died of, of uh, the disease, I think about four years later, struggling in this illness against state negligence for communal responsibility and care. It's a call to action. Today, you know, we can find evidence of urgent artifacts like these everywhere, using visibility to agitate. Parker Bright did something like this, using their body as a platform to both obscure the view of Dana Schutz's controversial painting and to deliver the message written, handwritten on their back, Black Death Spectacle, to an audience at the museum who photographed and posted the message all over social media, forever changing our read of the painting. Wherever there is visibility, though, there is also privileged, the ability to use one's body and to have it read clearly. For many bodies, this is not a safe strategy at all. And so refusal and illegibility are also tactics for us to look at here. And there's a whole range of artists who work against visibility today, particularly in the fight for racial, transgender, mental health, and immigration justice. And I also wanna draw your attention to the work of American artist, a black artist who legally changed their name in 2013 as an act of refusal and illegibility, reframing both of those words, American and artist. In refusing to use their birth name, they're manipulating legibility, denying and shaping perception around who gets to claim those words and how whiteness persists in art world spaces. And there's not enough time here really to get into their work in detail, but if you don't know it um, and their writing, please you know, devote some of your attention to how American artist is working today. 
specifically in how they use refusal and how they resist the ultimate smooth flow of mainstream design and, and art world perfection. So we're getting towards the end of the talk here. And so for the remainder, I, I would really like to tell you um, about the, what I've been working on lately and, and how I'm trying to bring these queer strategies of, of resistance and survival into my own spaces, uh, into my, my own practice and in my teaching and in community building. This is a, I taught a new class at RISD last year, Urgency Lab, where we really experimented with staying with the mess and what it might look like to step away from an institution like RISD and work outside of its values of exceptionalism and competition and perfection. And, you know, at the end of the semester, the whole class really hesitated to produce any kind of object or product at all, but we did, we did. We published um, this collaborative deck of cards called Urgency Cookbook that simply foregrounds all the values that emerged in the space of the class. Outside of school, I'm continuing to publish, inviting artists and writers into these collaborative uh, publishing spaces where we prioritize queer ways of working and expression. These are the artists who contributed to the first issue of Queer Archive Work, which launched two years ago. And the second issue I did at the Internet Archive um, in San Francisco. And then this is issue number three. These are all unbound publications. Um, they're all completely loose. It's, it's a loose assemblage of prints and zines, and it can all sort of fall apart without fixing any one narrative. And the amazing artists and writers who appear in this issue. And you can see sort of the aesthetics of the mess. Um, full on, on full display here in our installation at the New York Art Book Fair um, last year. This was for issue number three. But it's not just, uh, you know, about the look or the optics of illegibility. It's about deprioritizing the quick fixed read and empowering readers to do the work of shaping the material themselves. We did one issue of Urgency Reader late last year with about 80 contributors. And another one this year at the very start of the pandemic, just as the East Coast was shutting down. This was an open call and about 110 contributors uh, submitted work from quarantine. And this was also a mutual aid project using grant funding to distribute money to all of the contributors who either accepted the compensation or donated it back to the pool. And this was a tremendous learning experience for me. I hadn't done anything quite like that because a real community started to emerge from these publishing spaces. A few more shots of Urgency Reader 2. Um, these are all risograph prints. Um, I acquired a risograph printer uh, two years ago, um, which has radically changed how I'm making this work. The risograph gives me the power to really control how these things are made and how they get produced and distributed. This year, um, in January, I, I decided to relocate the risograph printer into a new space here in Providence and open it up for others to use. And I created a nonprofit organization called Queer, Arch Queer Archive Work. So the publication has now turned into a space. It's a community publishing space open to anyone, but prioritizing queer and trans, black, indigenous, and POC makers who may not have easy access to traditional art world spaces. And at the heart of the space is the risograph printer as a tool of empowerment, um, as a way to gain control of the entire pr publishing process outside of traditional publishing spaces. And by traditional, I'm even including 
the so-called alternative or indie publishing scene, which is still so often white and cis and male and privileged, uh, which of course I am all those things as well. So how that figures in the formation of the space is, is a huge challenge for us and an ongoing part of it. Access to the space is always free. We've got this fantastic uh, small library that's forming physically in the space with zines and books and examples of experimental publishing that, that I've been collecting, but also that people are now contributing to the space when they visit or when they're making things on the printer. And these are just some images from our collection, which has doubled in size since we opened uh, in January. We recently started a download library, which lets anyone online access this uh, time machine of indie publishing focused mostly on urgency, radical thinking, and liberation. And it's continuing to grow. It's still, it's still a small collection, but the PDFs in here are really a treasure. So I, I hope you um, spend some time with it and download and get inspired by what's in there. Just this week, earlier this week, we also launched a tool sharing library here in Providence. Uh, this is a distributed library, meaning that all of the items in the collection are stored in our homes and in our workspaces throughout Providence, and they're available for anyone to use freely. So the idea of a library as a network of people and, and things. My dream has always been to bring financial and creative support to artists uh, directly. So we started a series of Rizzo residencies this summer, and it's been a huge success. Um, we've got 10 residents this year, half from Providence, half from outside of Rhode Island. Um, every month an artist gets to use the entire studio uh, for themselves for up to two weeks and a cash grant to help them with their work. And I think we're, we're kind of running out of time here and I wanna make sure we have time for questions. So I'm gonna go super quickly since you have access to this. Um, Sierra Michelle Peters got us started in August. She was the first resident. Next up was um, Sloan Leo in September, a New York City based artist and designer. I had stuff to say about all of this, but um, you can actually read it in the notes that are here on the website. And Zaka Ivare, who just finished their October residency. And right now, um, Jason and Lila, who are uh, two local high school students, um, are they're in the space and they're starting a new BIPOC literary zine for Rhode Island based teens. Um, and they're amazing. It's a slow process, building community. We, we, we meet weekly on, on Zoom. I'm learning a lot about what it means to gather, especially these days on platforms like Slack and Instagram and Zoom. I'm learning to slow down and to let things emerge and to work at the speed of trust, which is an expression borrowed from Adrienne Marie Brown, who writes about it in their book, Emergent Strategy. And to really think counterintuitively about urgency as a slow, ongoing commitment to maintenance and communal care. Too often, urgency is used to exert pressure and power over the situation. So I'm looking closely at how we use that idea in publishing, how urgency can instead be a call for the slow, ongoing work of communal care, away from institutions that use speed and highly visible results as a form of gatekeeping, as a way to make thoughtful decision-making really difficult. These days, I talk about these queer strategies of resistance and survival as a set of principles, and I've been calling it urgent craft. But it's really about prioritizing anti-racism, justice, and liberation in your work. I covered a, a bunch of these here today in, in this talk, but not all of them. So I, I hope you spend some time with this and consider it my call to action for all of you. And this is the last slide. Um, 
I'm just going to end with this very last paragraph here. This is a piece I wrote recently for the Creative Independent. Um, use the urgent, graph, the urgent craft principles, reshape them, add to them, share them. And if nothing else, keep them around as a reminder that art and design can be used to loosen power. That's it. Thank you. That was fantastic, Paul. I, that is, I mean, there, I have so many notes here. Of course, I can't read my own handwriting, so I'm going to have to like call you back and ask exactly what you meant by, by certain things. But I am, the thing that's so exciting to me is the, the confirmation that as artists and designers, we have this remarkable ability and um, responsibility as communicators that we are, that is one of the things we do well. And um, you, you started your career obviously as an architect and then you moved on to, to graphic design and you, know, for, you worked as um, branding and strategy. How do you make the jump from, I'm a traditional graphic designer and branding and strategy to I am going to focus on, on these broader definitions of what it means to be a designer and um, and take on political ac ac action and mm -hmm. really and you know be engaged in a different sphere. How does how does that happen? Um, it's it's really hard. <laughs> it was very very <laughs> difficult thing to do. The way you just described it makes it sound like you know it could have happened overnight, or <laughs> like you just flip a switch or something. Um, I wish I wish it were that easy, but in fact, uh, you know when I give a talk here in 45 minutes and compressing like, you know, many years into something that's, you know, hopefully uh, easily understood. Um, I would say it was actually a huge struggle for me. I remember around 10 years ago when I started to get this sense that something was really wrong with the way that I was working. Uh, it's not that I wasn't happy with everything that I had built and all the work that I had done, but there was, there was a lot that was missing. But I didn't, you know, I can talk about that now easily, but back then I, I, I didn't know how to identify it. You know, I didn't know what that missing thing was or how I needed to change or how my work needed to change. So honestly, it was really scary, you know, um, when you're, whenever you're making any kind of big shift like that in your work. But I think it's crucial to just always be asking questions. Um, I think that's how you get to other places, you know, I think that's how you keep the investigation going. Um, yeah, without getting into back into the whole history of it, I guess that's, I'll leave it at that, you know, just that it was a huge struggle. Thank you, I, I really appreciate that. It's, I mean, it's true, when when you do a lecture, it's sort of, every, the inherently, it everything comes off as flawless and wonderful and easy because of the time constraints and the fact that you're typically showing finished product. And, right. um, and then you know you talk about sort of big life changes and and but, but I love the fact you're saying yes this is not easy this isn't like oh well, I went to lunch one day with friends and it's like hey let's change you know but yeah it takes yeah, yeah. time um, we have a I, bunch I, of questions there like, are yeah. there's no way we're getting through all of these because the, this is um, amazing um, what I'm, I'm going to start with Ibrahim's um, how do we escape high level thinking which often paralyzes our work. Interesting question, because I'm not quite sure what you mean by high level. Um, if, I mean, I can, I can make some assumptions there, but I'm not quite sure where you're coming from with high level and why high level means paral paralysis, um, you know. I mean, I'm but I guess I would- Abraham, I think that has, okay. I, I'm gonna guess that what he's talking about is this idea of there's sort of this rigor of high design that we, you know, that you're, you're sort of like, this is, this is the right way to do things. And this is good high design, you know? And so how do you say I'm busting through that? Right, right. And I see Abraham added later going into the definition of words and conceptual thinking. Yeah, well, I think, I think theory and conceptual thinking is, um, it's important for me because it, uh, and I try to communicate this to students and to you know people who I'm working with because because it allows me to 
poke and interrogate certain ideas. It allows me to ask those questions. You know, when I, when I read theory or I read history or I'm thinking about conceptual thinking that other people have done, I, I don't see it as paralysis at all, quite the opposite. I see it as giving me a kind of framework or a, um, a structure for asking questions in a particular way. And yeah, so I, how, how, to, how can that also like make us stuck? I can, I can imagine getting caught in, so for instance, earlier this, this past summer, I, was, I took a really intense um, queer theory course with some amazing scholars and there were about 45 people online in the class. Almost all of them were PhD students and um, professors and I would say that this is a world, you know, where theory and the academic can really get sort of stuck, you know, academic terms, and it becomes a very uh, sealed off and exclusive zone for certain kinds of vocabulary and ideas that are very difficult for, um, you know, to access. Um, so I guess I would, I, would, I would question, you know, entering that world of theory or using theory and not also like stepping outside of it at the same mm -hmm. time. For me, that back and forth is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Wow, there are a lot of questions. I know, yeah. <laughs> and they're not embarrassing. I'm sorry, we really, I, I, I prompted everyone, please ask the embarrassing questions, but clearly no one does really <laughs> fun anymore. <laughs> they're all really good. Um, there's an embarrassing question from Ibrahim. How do you keep your head so smooth? <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know. I don't know, Ibrahim, if you mean like, like literally or, <laughs> or my thinking. <laughs> I'm going to choose to think that you're talking about thinking in my head. Um, I'm very interested in this question, Sean, if you don't mind, um, in the chat, Claudio says, LOL, is there a large demand of students who are interested to take classes like this at your institution? How can you increase awareness via the classroom to something away from the norm? Mm -hmm. Really great question. The, the honest answer here, here is um, no, there, there, there is not a large demand. Uh, you know, I, there, there was a demand, but I would say it was a small group of students, you know, who came into a class like this. And I would also say that this was one of the most difficult, difficult experiences that I've had teaching, trying to get comfortable with the sense of what happens if we step away. How does one step away from the institution when you're within it? This is an impossible task. But we were in the space to ask that question and to try to make ourselves a, as uncomfortable as possible as we could. Mm -hmm. um, and this meant trying to get uncomfortable with uncertainty, um, trying to decenter myself as the teacher, which you can never fully do. But you know that became part of part of the class as well. Um, but I'm, I'm really glad that someone brought it up because that's a whole other talk, like pedagogy and all of these ideas. I mean, I think it's so important that an institution, I mean, any, any educational institution offer the range, the, the spectrum that is the profession and allows for work on either end so that yeah. um, people then make their own choices. I feel comfortable here. This is the world yeah. I want to inhabit. Um, I didn't, when I went to school, you know, which was at another place, it was very clear, do not do commercial work, period. Like you are mm. a horrible, evil human being if you do it, but, and. Um, I find that many and times. So I like, it's one of the great things about RISD oh, too, is that there is that range. There is, oh, there's a huge range. Yeah, there's a huge range, mostly because within the entire school, there's a huge range. We have like over 20 different departments in, in art and design, but we're also quite siloed in sort of where students stay once they're there within the school. Um, I find that many times a lot of my students don't see all the options that are available to them. Hmm. You know, they, they're looking for a very clear path into the profession. And um, I've got students who go on, who leave to become poets or to become an artist or to go work at Facebook uh, or to go start their own practice in commercial graphic design, all of the above and all valid as far as I'm concerned. I just, I'm not trying to um, 
uh, indoctrinate anyone. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to present options, you know, to say, you know, there are other things that you can do with your thinking and with your talents besides the obvious sometimes. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's one of the things is why it's so important to have have a visiting artist like you talk about your experience and your work. Yeah. yeah. That there are multiple paths and, um, and, you know, you've taken, you've made the hard choices along the way to take that path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that, that within the course of a career, you can have many paths. You know, it's not well, like oh yeah. They're not yeah. just one. You know, you go like like you, like me, you know, we've gone down one path and then switched to another. And um That's really, important. really important. I mean, we all have permission to lead multiple lives, you know. And how do we how do we get to that point where you you can make those shifts and then you yeah. can pivot? And you can be contradictory. I think it's to give people permission to have contradiction is mm -hmm. is fine. You know? there, so there's I, I will let you choose the other ones, the other questions you want to answer. Oh boy. Okay. Um, well, I also want to say, if since there are so many, and if there's really any anything that you want to reach out to me about and ask uh, via email or on social media, et cetera, please, you know, for anyone who wants to follow up and continue, or if we're not getting to your question here and through my, through my website, you'll, you'll find my email. And, and, I, and if you, Paul, if you're up for it, we'll, I'll, I'd love to bring you back and just say here, it's three hours with Paul is like the special <laughs> event and yeah. um, really give people a chance to have a dialogue with you. I think that sure. would be um, incredible. And since, yeah. since Victoria invited me, should we just, um, Read her. Yeah, question. Victoria, you're so good, right? You oh, read? yeah, you can say it because yeah. you're. She can analyst. speak. She's oh, yeah. <laughs> and here I voice. am. Woo yeah. <laughs> um, first off, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us. I really, really enjoyed your talk. Um, and I love just how thoughtful you are with your words. And it's also great getting to see just uh, examples of references to artists who um, maybe like we don't talk that much about in, in some classrooms. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's really eye-opening, and thank you for that. Um, so my question thank is for, um, for you as an educator and, and being kind of a faculty at RISD, and as students, I think we often are inspired and influenced by uh, the work of our teachers, and I'm interested in hearing in what ways have your students inspired you in your personal work? How have they inspired me? Oh my goodness, endless, endless inspiration. Um, I shortly Right at the start of when I was teaching at RISD, I, I, I proposed an elective called Experimental Publishing Studio. Um, and I taught that for four years. Um, and that class really, and the work that students were doing, the work that I was able to do with students, um, that class really formed the basis for a lot of what was in this talk, especially that whole middle section where I was talking about publishing. It was really coming out of this, these collaborative spaces of working with students, um, seeing what uh, students would do with some of these ideas, what, what they wouldn't do, you know, like what, what sticks and what doesn't. Um, after that, the Urgency Lab, the students in there, who I, many of whom I remain in touch with, you know, have, have been incredibly inspiring to me in the forming of my new space of the new queer archive work, you know, nonprofit organization that really comes right out of um, urgency lab and the work that the students did in there and their, their willingness to, to go along with these questions and, and with the uncertainty of like, wow, this class, this class is going to be a little bit different. What if we don't know exactly what the outcome is going to be? Um, yeah. So, I'm on sabbatical this semester, I'm not teaching, and I'm really kind of itching to get back because I, I, love, I love being in, in a classroom and in a studio with students and, and being able to, you know, it, it's a constant dialogue. Um, you, have, you, you have access to the Q&A also, right? Yeah, I'm seeing it here. I'm so curious, is rhythm an elitist sensibility? Wow. That is such a question. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea how to answer that. Um, I hope it isn't. Uh, <laughs> that again is another like needs to be a conversation. Let's see. I thought 
publishing was more like making a book, but I have realized it has a much broader meaning. You said it as an act, gesture, and performance. I forgot the last one. Can you tell the last one again? An act and a gesture and a performance. Um, was there a last one? I think you've, you've said it perfectly here. I mean, you've said basically what I was saying in, in the talk. Um, publishing as an act, as a gesture, as performance, as movement, about it's about the circulation of your material and what is being talked about around the circulation of your material. Um, I have found with students that when we ask that question, what do you want the discourse to be around your work? And then we go backwards from there. Well, then what form should your public should your work take? How should you publish this? I like to go all the way to like someone is holding the thing in their hands or seeing the thing on the screen. What is that conversation that you're having with them? Um, what are they telling others? What are they writing about in, you know, inspired and influenced by your work? And then how do we go backwards from there to figure out like, well, what's the best way to reach that person? What's the best way to manifest those conversations? And that's where you can really sort of be surprised about what forms publishing can take, that it doesn't always have to be a zine, that it doesn't always have to be a book. I had a question about uh, about um, in that in terms of publishing um, along those lines, the idea of um, authorship and um, create you know the the creator as opposed to anonymity. That you know you could say okay, I'm I'm publishing on Instagram anonymously. I'm publishing. I'm I'm responding to posts anonymously. Is that what? I, and and so much of the work that you're showing has clear authors. There are people yeah. that are listed and credited as the mm -hmm. editor or as the um, creator. Um, do you need to have, does it have to be credited to be valid? I don't think so. I think, I think one thing that's happened with the internet, with network culture, I think one of the most radical things to happen is authorship has been called into question in a huge way. You know, our ability to appropriate, to cut and paste, to pose as someone else, to use an avatar, to be anonymous, all of that um, enables, you know, the internet and network culture to be what it is today. And so I think, I think publishing happens in spite of that, you know, I think, I think a lot of really important publishing is happening anonymously. If you think about leaks, you know, yeah. if you think p politically what it means to leak something, like who is the whistleblower? Um, sometimes anonym anonymity is crucial for publishing when you're actually trying to like make something happen in a political way. Um, sometimes publishing is crucial for safety. You know, I'm thinking about a couple of years ago when the Me Too movement w was exploding online everywhere, but online specifically there was uh, someone who was later outed anonymously created a spreadsheet, you know, of terrible men, you know, and it was where people could come and thousands of people came and told stories and identified people and it was written about all over the place and someone ended up finding, you know, discovering the identity of this person who started the spreadsheet and outing them and it was, you know, and that's awful. Um, there's, there's so many efforts like that, especially around community and mutual aid and um, safety that now depend on an, the possibility of anonymity. And that's becoming harder and harder online mm -hmm. um, because of our culture of surveillance. I think we have time okay. for maybe one more question and then one more. by 2.15, I will have to let them go or their yeah, yeah, faculty yeah. Okay. will abuse them mercilessly. Um, the very last one in the Q and A is publishing. If publishing is to create a public, can it be equated to creating a culture? Yes, that's a great way to put it. Definitely. Um, I think when we when we make public, we are shaping we're shaping culture. Culture is is fundamentally, you know, about the sharing of of um, material in some kind of social way. You know, like as a society, we. Um, we are sharing with each other and this is where culture is, is coming from. Um, so I think publishing is, is very much a part of that. 
Yeah, that's also for me. And when I see when I have when I see artists coming into the queer archive workspace to use the risograph printer for the very first time, um, this happened with Lila and Jason, the two high school students who are in there right now. Yesterday, I was showing them how to use the risograph machine, and Jason was a little hesitant because you know, like, what's going to happen? Am I going to break it? Lila just wanted to like dive into it and get started. And I thought just that right there, the feeling of like hesitation because it's a powerful thing and also the desire and the enthusiasm to like jump into it. That power, the, this is why I talk about, you know, the risograph printer or any kind of tool as an, empower, an empowering um, tool, as an empowering <laughs> thing uh, because, of a, because of what it enables us to do and how it enables us to shape culture. You feel that, you know, I think I'm sure as students, you all feel that when you put something out there, when you show something to someone and you, and you see, oh yes, it's communicating, like that's a powerful moment. Mm -hmm. It's what we do as designers, as artists. Yeah, I am, um, I, I mean, this has been fantastic and I hope you're, we, we're gonna drag you back for in the spring term. Right. We'll find a time and um, set something up because this has been amazing and I, mean, I sure. love I would love to. The work's amazing and the thinking's incredible. And and you know, you you you're fearless, clearly. So um that, <laughs> that's always true, but thanks. and I love the fact that it, that it's lo-fi. I love that. That it's mm. not like it is not you do not need any metallic foils for this stuff to work. Um <laughs> you can do a that's lot true. with very little and um make a difference so it's it's super important so you know that's a huge I, part of it yeah yeah uh, actually so. so really thank you actually, so much Sean, thank for, you for having no, me yeah been, and for victoria for, for inviting me and all I mean, of you for showing up there are a lot of people on this call a lot so of people. thank you yeah I, yeah. yeah I you meet paula oh really yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's not a competition <laughs> it's not thank you so all much right. paul all right. We'll Thank be in you. Time. You're out of time. All right. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining. Thanks, everybody, for all the questions. Yeah. Bye.